What is the inner earth? My first, I guess, introduction to any of the inner earth information was on the smart glass pad. And for those of you who don't watch the show, it was a plexiglass-like pad that if you found it on the ground, you would think it was unremarkable. But there was a uh, bio-neural interface component that worked with it, where it would show you what you wanted by thinking it, and would show you in your language, and you would get three-dimensional displays off of it. It, it. it was like a dumb terminal that connected to a database of all of this information. And we had two different databases. One of them was a uh, one that was owned by a non-terrestrial group that uh, we're working with. I'm not exactly sure which group it was. I'm fairly certain it was the Nordics. And uh, then we have the database that you connect to that is just uh, the military information, nothing off-world, other, other than what we've gleaned on our own. So a lot of the time I spent on the research vessel, it was quite boring. I was either wiping down the walls, um, setting up or breaking down modular building, uh, modular rooms for different uh, experiments. So we would get a lot of time to look at these smart glass pads. And for some reason, the inner earth stuff uh, got my attention. I really liked it. And there, there was a decent amount of information, but it was only probably in the late 70s that some of these beings that were connecting to military types, they were saying they were from a, a different star system. And it turned out that many of them came from below the earth. And they were just telling us that for operational security so we wouldn't you know, come down and uh, ruin the good thing they have going. And as it states, um, we had access to a lot of very high tech data. I was not super scientific minded, so I stuck to the outline information more than I did the actual scientific papers, which I would tend to get lost in. There are major cavern networks all around the earth. A lot of these are have to do with the creation um, of geothermal activity, like lava tunnels. Some of them are quite large. Others come from rift systems that have been exploited by non-terrestrials many thousands of years ago and they had connected rift systems with tunnels that they created and this was the ancient builder race that disappeared and since then not different non-terrestrial groups inner earth groups and military groups have been exploiting the same underground um, waterways and oh some areas the size of texas that are open underground Some of them are so large that condensation builds up, they have rain, they have misty type clouds. The, the art that I've had depicted, it, you cannot recreate the feeling of when you walk in into a giant cavern and look around and it's, there's no way that you can really depict the, the size of these caverns. Amazing. Most of the tunnel, most of the uh, cavern network that are used by non-terrestrials and humans alike are at the most usually about, about 40 miles deep or less, within 20 to 40 miles. Interestingly enough, there is a, um, some sort of UN law, just like if you go out in the middle of the ocean, you're in uh, international territory where certain laws don't apply. That, uh, has they've written laws like that for space but also if you go to a certain depth in the earth after you get a certain like miles deep you're in international territory you're not if you went directly below somewhere in texas i can't remember how many miles it is but once you get to a certain point you're not considered to be in america anymore and american laws do not apply that's why they do a lot of their unacknowledged like unacknowledged as um Stephen Greer has said uh, programs is another way of saying illegal.
they're they're not legal. So people that are bound uh, to keep secrets in unacknowledged programs, these are uh, illegal programs, and they shouldn't be held accountable for leaking that information, in my opinion. Interestingly enough, it turns out that humans on the surface have sought refuge in the inner earth many times in our history. Some of the documentation that I saw on the smart glass pad and imagery that was shown were uh, sort of ancient Aztec looking structures that had been abandoned long ago that were inside these caverns, not super deep, fairly close to the surface where it was obvious that thousands of people had lived there for a protracted amount of time, most likely to allow the surface to return to normal. And what I later found out was that different inner earth groups, different non-terrestrial groups, were rescuing groups of people on the surface and bringing them under. And it was part of this um, this grand genetic experiment through over 22 different genetic experiments going on on the planet. So they are protecting their experiment, their investment. It's kind of like doing an emergency backup so that they don't have to start over again. They, they found a lot of interesting life below ground. Uh, most of it's been, uh, a lot of it's been reported, but there are some that it would seem like a sci-fi movie. Giant, not exactly mushroom looking, but fungus that uh, give off blue light, some of them give off like an orange light, green light. Um, there are um, there, there are all these different types of plant-like and fungus-like life forms down there that actually give off light. They'll break down dead material or some of them actually break down the walls and themselves and pull minerals out of out of the cave walls now what was really interesting in, in some of the imagery there were huge cavern areas where it looked almost like a green greenish sky but what it turns out is that all along the ceiling was this lichen type matted material that was absorbing the rock it turning as a waste material putting out bioluminescent light and it wasn't enough to where you could see super well but it was it's almost like wearing a pair of the uh the goggles that the military used for um, uh, starlight uh, amplification Of course, we're gonna find all the things that uh, slither and crawl down there. And uh, most of them are either blind or have zero pigment in them at all, which I don't think is very surprising. Yeah, the salamanders look really nasty, don't they? <laughs> so we have, you know, a lot of different types of life plant and plant life that is uh, very interesting but of course then we start moving up to to things that think and eat and uh, breathe the way we do uh, on uh, cosmic disclosure i talked about uh, this first being that they would see a lot they had uh, red reflective eyes large eyes very pale human they're obviously a human group that had come down one of these during one of these cataclysms and never left and then started to adapt supposedly they're very stealthy you're very rarely going to see one you might hear them and if you catch them with your light you're going to catch a very large pink red iris on them but for the most part they are uh, hard they're hard to catch unfortunately uh, when the, the military expeditions when they would go down they would, uh, they would want a closer look at a specimen. They would uh, terminate it and then get a closer look. And unfortunately, the ones that I saw had uh, been shot and were 
being videoed as they were being pointed at and the, the ribs and they were showing, you know, unemotionally just showing the being they just shot. There are tall black reptoids that control different areas below ground and they seem to have their own agenda. A lot of, uh, a lot of them have mainly been seen in the, uh, the Middle East and Northern, Northern Africa type areas underground. Now, there's, there was a comic book that came out all, a long time ago. Um, it was, I um, can't remember the name of it now. They um, were talking about these very elephant looking inner earth beings, they called the Darrow, that were very um, aggressive, very negative toward human beings. And I had actually seen information about them while I was in the programs. I happened to be uh, two years ago at the Conscious Life Expo before I had become public at all. I went and saw uh, Jupiter Ascending with David Wilcock. And uh, we're sitting in, in the chairs and this being pops up and it looks so similar to the imagery I'd seen. I was like, I, I slightly was like, whoa. But if you see David tells a story, tell a story, it's like I had a mild seizure next to him or something. <laughs> He likes to overanimate everything, but yeah. that, that movie had some interesting disclosure in it from a, uh, a very dark perspective. So what is the, the hollow earth? This is a story that's been around for a long time. It's not new by any means. What was often believed was that we had a center sun the inside of the crust was hollow, and on the inside there were just people, you know, sailing around and living just mirror to us on the other side. Well, it turns out that there are large enough areas to where I could see where people could get that idea that they, they think it's just one giant empty area, but it's a honeycomb. It's a honeycomb earth. The uh, from centrifugal forces, um, heating and cooling, the convection of the earth. Over time, it's created this entire zone that are porous, like like a honeycomb, and a lot of them connect with each other through rift systems, which I, I mentioned earlier. And uh, ancient aliens have carved out those areas and made them uh, to where you can transfer, uh, transnavigate the planet. Oh, so there, there are underground lakes, oceans rivers and uh, a vast amount of water that is locked up in the, uh, the that are in rocks that is crystallized and recently it's, it's been scientifically announced that uh, locked up in the rocks below ground uh, is way more water than we have in our oceans there's plenty of water down there and a lot of it is very mineral rich as you would imagine These underground rivers are, it's pretty amazing how we have submarines that are navigating these underground rivers. Could you imagine being the Lewis and Clark that discovered and mapped out those, those areas? You know, I'm sure there's plenty of information about people lost, uh, some heroin experiences doing that. The Legend of Agartha. It, really became popular during, again, during the 1930s and 40s. The Germans loved it, the, uh, I guess, that, that area of Europe. And they didn't think it, of it as a fanciful story. They believed it to be, to be fact. The subterranean civilizations were called the Agartha Network. And uh, many times, as I mentioned earlier, these subterranean groups, they would come up and masquerade as gods or angels. And as we became more sophisticated, they had a chain, their story had to be more sophisticated. Then they began to tell us that uh, they came from different star systems. There are definitely other beings from different star systems that look very similar to them that are visiting us. So, uh, a lot of people think that I'm trying to say, well, people from Andromeda or this are, are, are lying. It, 
we they were we just know that they were lying to humanity about where they were from because they were worried that we would if we found out where they were we would come down and invade which i can't disagree with And of course, the uh, Agarthian UFOs, uh, they were co they're called the Silver Fleet, which is interesting. One of the groups that I met that were associated with the Anshar, they have a, uh, a fleet that they call the Silver Fleet. And I don't know if it's the same or not. Admiral Bird has He's been uh, a character that has been brought up all throughout the inner earth type of uh, uh, stories and, and also anything that had to do with, you know, the Germans being down in, in Antarctica setting up bases. But you, you can't really talk about the subject without bringing the bad more birds. diary came out at one point and there's a lot of controversy on whether it's true or not you have people that are uh, ready to uh, do battle with you either way so uh, I, I do know that in the programs that uh, they stated that uh, that part of his information was not accurate that uh, he had an actual diary that talked about um, well, that should come out someday in after full disclosure that, that talked about moment to moment everything that occurred on uh, this trip down during Operation High Jump. But uh, according to, and, and it's interesting that in recent excavations, I'm getting ahead of myself, that they're finding prehistoric animals down in Antarctica. Because in this book, he is stating that they started to see mastodon and, and woolly mammoth type beings. So there has to be some some sort of truth or uh, information seeded in in this uh, diary that is giving us some information that we should pay attention to at least. And of course, the diary claimed that. Uh, Admiral Byrd was flying over, south, uh, over Antarctica and was, uh, I guess, flown in uh, next to him. He was given an uh, escort flight by a UFO. They landed him in a green area, free of ice, and he was then introduced to these tall, blonde, Nordic-looking beings that had Germanic-type accents. And um, he visited with them a while. They talked about how warlike we are, which that seems to be the common theme with uh, every group that's talking to us. And um, then he was escorted back to meet up with his, um, with his fleet. I guess everyone's heard about the Nazis and um, they, had, they were obsessed with the ancient information and how it could tie in to them and their conquest. They were going all through the Himalayas, going to these monasteries that hadn't seen another human being other than the people watching it in hundreds of years, went in with their machine guns and uh, looted the places and came out with some very interesting um, scrolls that had that looked exactly like a schematic for making spacecraft. So that they got a major head start with some of the information that they located. Now, while they were there, they found out that, and they're interrogating these priests and uh, monks, they found out that these monks were claiming to be in contact with an inner earth group and that they were um, protecting their secrets and and it, it seems that finally the Germans were able to, through these people, meet these inner earth groups that um, very well, a lot of people think they're, they're the inner earth groups, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that it's this Nordic group, this ET Nordic group that's uh, been trying to work against the reptilians for millennia uh, for uh, not necessarily control of the earth, but to try to help us fight back. So 
this was when they they really the Germans really started to meet with this inner earth group or this Agarthan group. It was right around the same time that they also started to meet with the reptilians. And the reptilians were happier to give them more militaristic type of information and provide a place for them in Antarctica to move uh, as the war winded down. The, uh, the reptilians invited the Nazis into an area that was once an ancient civilization. The Germans moved right in. They were cataloging the information that they were finding, but they were just mainly worried about setting up a uh, submarine military base very quickly for the fleeing elite of Germany. This is the Mayan group. This is really the first group I really ended up getting introduced to. They fly in large cylindrical vessels that were pretty much carved out of the inside of a mountain or deep in the earth and teleported out into space. So if you were in one walking around it does not look that technological. You see stone walls, you feel like you're in a cave. And then every once in a while you'll see something strange, like something floating off the ground, kind of slowly turning, that has symbols on it that obviously looks technological. Back be before I really started talking to David about all of this, and all of this came out, I had... Uh, recently had a detached retina and I was having surgeries from it and during, uh, after one of the surgeries, I all of a sudden started recalling a lot of the real negative things I was forced to do, a lot of really bad, bad stuff that a lot of us were forced to do over that 20 years and I was just about suicidal. I was, I was really, I was in bad shape. My wife was extremely worried about me. And then one night uh, in my house, a, a human being pops in along with a bunch of these uh, Mayan looking people. And it was the first time that I met Lieutenant Commander Gonzalez. He was with them and he was just giving me instructions because they wouldn't talk or interface with me. They brought me up to this ship and put a halo device on my head. And they used their technology, their healing technology, to help me, I guess, for, not really forget, but file away some of those memories. They told me there was no positive reason for me to have access to them at this point. And a lot of the other memories, somehow they removed the emotional charge associated with them. So I could ha have the memory not have the flow of emotions that were associated with it. <clears throat> this helped me quite a bit. If they hadn't done that, I never would have gotten to the point to where I would have been able to, you know, talk so openly about this information. Most recently, they've, they've been doing a lot of um, further help with me. It turns out that the um, all of the blank slating that they had done to me, the experience uh, in time in these high magnetic fields that the, uh, these torsion field drives have on our craft, they're not good for your neurology at all over, over long periods of time. So a lot of people, when they come out, they, they start having weird purple tunnel type neurological issues all over, um, memory issues, and um, I've been having a lot of those issues and they've been helping me uh, what little they can because a lot of it has to do with if they they don't want to I guess reactivate memories and emotions that they helped uh, you know help me with earlier so I'm um, going through that with them and um, Gonzalez uses this looks like a black cue, cue ball and he walks up and he just scans my forehead and will scan me up and down with it it just looks like a stone it's hard to imagine how it could be technological and then I finally had my meeting with the inner earth people it was 
it was just a story I had read on the smart glass pad. And other than, I really didn't know what had happened with the Mayan group. I didn't know who they were. <clears throat> I didn't know they were an inner earth group. So my, my first experience <clears throat> was meeting Kari here. Uh, she's a, <laughs> they put in their inner, inner earth virgin priestess. <laughs> She's a inner earth priestess, who I guess happens to be a virgin. Um, she's over 130 years old when I interfaced with her. I was able to glean that. And uh, her people, they live much, much longer than that, over a thousand years. The first time I met, they actually teleported me down there with uh, really no warning. Since then, they started using this uh, ability they have. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like teleconferencing, but it, uh, it's all occurring telepathically. And you would appear in this area that David Wilcock uh, dubbed the construct, I guess, from the Matrix. It's the area that's all white, and we'll sit at a table and meet, or you know, have a quick meeting, and then it's over. So sometimes I'm teleported down there, uh, but most often recently it's uh, meetings and what we're calling the construct. I met seven different groups when I was down the first time, and the fact that these seven groups were coming together was unprecedented. They don't normally associate um, or work together, but a lot had been going on with people from Earth using new type of scalar type of weapons and uh, striking deep in the Earth to try to get to them. And uh, they were having some issues with some uh, non-human groups that they do battle with from time to time that things were starting to get hot for them. So they were meeting as sort of an emergency kind of meeting. And uh, the Anshar, group had a Saturn symbol that they wore. And depending which group they were, they had a different stone in each uh, area of the, uh, of the amulet. There were some that were, that looked very much like this, that had dark hair, and a completely different group that most of them were, they had blonde hair or sandy brown hair. And then the third group that Kari came from that they were almost albino, completely white hair, and they had blue eyes, and were uh, they were all very pale. And their eyes are just barely larger than us. If you, every once in a while you see a person that has just very large eyes and they get your attention, I mean, it's only that mild of a difference. This group here, a lot of, uh, since I've announced them and talked about them, a lot of people have uh, had negative energy feelings from them. This group is um, mostly based, believe it or not, on Venus. And they have enclaves here on Earth as well, but they are, they're sort of uh, mil militaristic and they're very serious about guarding uh, the treasures on Venus. So that's uh, you know, that's that's what they that's what they do. But uh, the other inner Earth groups seem to also I wouldn't say didn't like them, but they didn't really seem to trust them. Kind of kept an eye on them. And then we had a very Asian-looking group. Now a lot of people they've seen on the, on the internet. Um, this mission that supposedly happened where they went to the moon, found a craft, and then found beings and stasis inside of them. And one of them, they dubbed the Mona Lisa. She had uh, a, a bump here on her forehead. And a lot of people are thinking that they could be from the same group. And she, I don't know, she'd been in space and in stasis if that was real for a long time. They, they look a little bit different than that. These, they looked, they had a very strong Asian look, look to them. And there was another group that had, it's 
Kind of like how under your skin you see your vein, the blue vein. Their, all of their skin was that exact same color. And uh, they had more of a, kind of a look from like they were from India or, or that area. They were all speaking back and forth, what I was told was a pre-Akkadian language. Very strange, different sounding than what you would hear. If you were, if you were a linguist, it would stand out very much. And there was, a, there was an African looking group that had a very strong, loving presence about them. It was, I mean, you could really feel it. David was surprised when I told him about this because there are a lot of aspects of the people in the secret space program that uh, are prejudiced. They have, I guess, issues, and they were trying to convince David that outside of the planet that there are no African-looking people, which is absolutely wrong. And this is the Anshar group that I've gotten to know the best. There's the blonde-looking ones. Same amulet. This is the group here that they had a space fleet or a fleet of spacecraft that are very formidable that they call the Silver Fleet. And I have no idea if they are associated with the other groups that have a Silver Fleet. The Raptors are a group that seemed to be a holdover, or I guess when the dinosaurs had been removed from the planet for this mammalian experiment, some of them had uh, been pulled underground to be kept safe. They're a remnant of the dinosaurs, they're proto-warm-blooded, and they, they look and move more like a bird than you would think of a reptile or a dinosaur. Real jerky, quick movements. Very fast, they're very fast. And uh, most of them have some sort of feathers on them, like a plume, that uh, are colorful. Some people think that uh, this could be behind some of the Quetzalcoatl kind of feathered serpent stories from the Mayans. Could be. I'm, I'm not sure about that myself, but it's they do inhabit a lot of uh, Central and South America. They've actually they've taken over a lot of areas, including some crystal caverns that these inner Earth groups used to use as libraries, and they lost access. And here's the ones we love to hate, the reptilians. They, people know more about them than just about any other race. But there are a whole, there, there are a lot of different types of reptilian types of beings. Some of them are rather short, like three and a half, four feet tall. They have a head shaped like the guy there on the right. That's kind of a uh, gray alien kind of look. They kind of look like gray aliens. And a lot of people that have been abducted by them or have had experiences with them have associated, thought that they were picked up by the greys when it was actually this group. And of course, we have the tall, um, white reptilians that are the, uh, I guess, the royalty. These things are, they're incredibly telepathic. Like, I, I, I've interfaced with a, a number of different types of beings, but nothing that, and I hate to use the word, but it almost seemed like, like rape. They grab your mind. They force you to experience what they want you to force, what they want you to experience, and uh, it's a very humili it's a humiliating experience, and it it drains you. A lot of these other beings, they are very give and take in their communications with you, and don't just you know take take you over. A lot of these uh, a lot of these reptilian groups, they run joint bases with modern humans and we've been working alongside with them for at least well 
the Americans, at least since the 50s, when after Operation Paperclip allowed the Germans to infiltrate the military industrial complex and pretty much take it over. So as a part of the inner earth, I guess we're a part of the inner earth now. We're setting up deep underground military bases all over the planet, under the ocean, very deep, and we're competing for territory with some of these older groups. A lot of the reason why they've been stating that they're putting all these uh, bases in the ground is for continuity of government, which is a little ridiculous. That's the same reason that they have built these different uh, bases on on Mars. Uh, they state that the, they built these for a continuity of species instead of continuity of government. If you know, uh, Earth was wiped out, they would have a, uh, a, a genetic stock of humans to draw from. As I stated, all these unacknowledged projects go on, human cloning, cloning has been going on for a long time. We supposedly didn't discover genetics until, was it 56, around that range? Well. We were working with non-terrestrials doing genetic experiments in the 30s and 40s. So this has been going, going on quite a bit longer than uh, most of us would think, the genetic part and our involvement in it. We, uh, of course, reverse engineer technology and do a lot of research and development. And we, they try to keep it below the area where they would be held accountable legally for what they do to a lot of the human uh, guinea pigs. This is a, everyone has probably seen this map. And um, what's interesting is that these Meglev trains, they do run all over the planet, but there is a much older Meglev train system that is non terrestrial, it is larger, and we've accidentally cut into it drilling holes a few times. And, you know, they run us out and tell us, can't, don't come back. But there is a huge, a much, much larger underground tunnel network that the non-terrestrials use. Recently, I received a report that I wasn't sure about. But David Wilcock talked to Pete Peterson, one of his insiders, and he seemed to back it up. After the election, a lot of these bases, FEMA-type bases, were supposed to be turned over and to, to the next administration's leadership. A lot of these people refused to do so. They locked the doors and said they weren't coming out. So we sent in Marines. The Marines went down and took forever to break through all of the, the concrete, the rebar, this, this reinforced steel, and they were told once they broke through to give everyone in the base one opportunity to surrender. If they refused to surrender or responded violently, they were ordered to wipe out all inhabitants, to wipe out everybody. Unfortunately, they did not completely brief a lot of these Marines that they might run into non-terrestrial beings. So a lot, a lot of these guys, they were they were really freaking out. They had a lot of problems because they went in, it was bad enough that they were having to kill all these humans, but now they were face to face with eight foot tall devils. And they were doing paddle with them. Of course, we eventually, you know, took the bases, but these soldiers I've, I've heard were, they did not take it well and they have not been recovering well from it. talk about some of my my lab experiences and as I stated before my labs it stands for military abduction and it it's we're learning more and more about the programs everybody wants to lump them under MK ultra or, or this or that there are so many different types of programs that we really need to come up with a different term my lab just it's just doesn't seem to be accurate anymore Once I was identified as an intuitive empath and brought into the MyLab program, when I was at school, they started picking me up in a white van 
and driving me for almost an hour to Fort Worth to Carswell Air Force Base. That base has a lot of uh, history going back to even Roswell. And of course, I would be taken with other kids. We would meet them. We would drive onto the base into a kind of a carpool area that was a hangar for just cars. We would get out, walk down a hall a little ways, and then take a large elevator deep into the ground where we would come out and there would be more hallways with uh, a guy in front of the intersection of the hallways and the elevator at a little card table that was uh, you know, checking IDs and making sure you were supposed to be there. Yeah, they had, uh, um, and it didn't turn out that the uh, the base, uh, the wing commander knew what was going on. I ended up talking to someone that served closely with him and they didn't believe me and then I described the base where I was driven and they were shocked. The tunnels that I went to, they they had been in them. They said they were for, uh, they were built during the Cold War era and they were shocked. At this point, this is when they started to acclimate us to extraterrestrials and we're trying to deprogram this natural fight or flight response we have. And I haven't really seen that it can be totally deprogrammed. I mean, right now, if I'm not expecting a reptilian is, or one of these other beings to appear here, if one appears, that I get overcome with a fight or flight response. And just about everyone does, especially if they don't look like what we would consider benevolent. We have a visceral reaction. They were trying to program that out of, out of people as much as possible, and us as children especially. So they would put us in situations in the beginning to where they would give us virtual reality scenarios and then start introducing non-humans through that way, or, or we would come out of being under um, uh, the, that type of technology. And when we went into the remote viewing session, or the remote viewing, the uh, um, augmented reality session. There would be like three or four guys sitting at a table and then we would come out and as they were unhooking us, you'd be looking around and all of a sudden there would be a great alien sitting at the table. And no one would say anything about it. They would just, you know, get you all unhooked and then you would walk out. And they, you know, they started to acclimate us like that. Now with this technology, it was virtual reality, but they were sending things to you bioneurally. There's a place in your back that where all the nerves cross, kind of like where the two little uh, dents in are in your back. And they have these two nodes that stick out. You lay against it and they stick against your back and it will send data to and from your nervous system through those areas. So they could also kind of like, I guess, in the matrix, give you an a college education or teach you about a certain technology very quickly using this technology as well as use it to train you and profile you to see how you will react under different circumstances. They would uh, they use some a lot of trauma-based testing in, the, in those scenarios a lot of times just to see how we would react, how much better of a personality profile they could draw up for us uh, to use that information to know how to use us in the future. At one point, we were taken to a, a crystal cavern. We were first taken underground on the tram system to a location to where there was, there were a number of uh, submarines sitting in a cavern looking area. They looked like regular submarines to me uh, of the era. In the, uh, this would have been in probably 80, between 81 and 83. I was 11 to 13 years old. So they loaded us all in these in these different subs and took us down. And where we ended up at the time was miraculous. Since then, they 
discovered similar looking caves. This one in Mexico. To where these are huge crystals that have formed over millions of years that it was it was about 140 degrees where we went. And they had us hooked up to instruments that monitored, monitored our health for several different reasons, as well as they had cameras, they had all types of different equipment in the room that were doing some sort of, they were measuring, uh, trying to measure something, like, like electrically. And I told the story on Cosmic Disclosure about how they, they wanted us to try to interface or to psychically connect with the crystals, that they warned us not to physically touch the crystals because the crystals could harm us or we could harm the crystals, that we were just to reach out to them. And uh, when I did so, I started to see this pink kind of aura around the crystal, and I, I got a download. I really couldn't, it was just too much information for me to try to uh, do a little stop in time to look at the picture. But when we were recently going over this information for the graphic novel, I remembered a, a off, kind of off, not really in the middle of all of this, but kind of back, was a very tall being in a similar suit we were in. And I could just see the, this part of their eyes, but between the top of their lip and their forehead. And they had very large, pale blue eyes and their skin was alabaster white. Interesting, I think some of the work that I'm doing with Gonzalez on with my memory and, and trying to fix some of the neurological issues, I'm starting to, uh, starting to trigger information that, for some reason, they didn't want me to have. It, it was beautiful. They were beautiful. And, you know, we were told that these crystals were, they had a life force to them. And basically, when we interfaced with them, we, uh, we connected with them and were downloading information, like a USB drive, and later, the information was, I guess, downloaded out of us. Of course, as protocol, at the end, we were all debriefed as a part of them also removing the data from us, and then we were blank slated and sent back up to the surface where we soon got into a white van, were driven to school, and then our parents picked us up. <laughs> and uh, we were uh, usually given a memory of um, going on a field trip to a museum or to see a show or something like that. The screen memories seem to fade away very quickly for me, and about three to five percent of, of the people. Um, for some reason, about three to five percent of the people they use these technologies on, uh, they're, they're unsuccessful, at least for very long. It, the way I've explained it is that, uh, I mean, how do we have memories from past lives? You know, our physical brains were not there to record the information. Well. Obviously, we have what, since I was in the IT field, we have a, a, a physical hard drive and we have a virtual hard drive. And everything we experience now and in other lives are backed up to that virtual hard drive. This physical hard drive can be messed with. It can be reformatted, it can be uh, reprogrammed, but the information that is up in the cloud, I guess you would say, can't be. And if they remove information from your physical hard drive, there seems to be three to five percent of the intuitive impasse, there seems to be a automatic download or type of thing that occurs where the information starts coming back and they're unable to um, erase the information permanently. This is the first time I went down to the Anshar area down in the inner earth. I was brought down. There was a, a bright flash. I wasn't expecting it. I was laying down, and all of a sudden I find myself, I'm laying down on a floor in a completely different environment. All of a sudden it's cooler. I can, I can smell and kind of taste minerals. I hear kind of echoey type of sounds. I was not where I was when I went to sleep. 
and I was in the middle of this this room and I saw people guarding doorways kind of off in the distance and at that point Ari Gonzalez and a small delegation approached me with, and I, I was still pretty nervous they then brought me to this cleansing room which was close by and it was because we were in on holy ground I guess you would say we had to remove the clothing we were wearing and cleanse ourselves in this pool and you know for me for them it was not that big of a deal but I was probably about 60 pounds heavier and all these people look like vegans <laughs> so first off I wasn't real excited about taking my clothes off and Gonzalez wasn't making it any easier I was kind of trying to hide the best I could and uh, Hari comes walking up with both, uh, towels and the tunic thing that I was supposed to wear the robe and as she was walking up I was kind of using him in between us to block and he saw what I was doing and he got a real uh, devious smile on his face and he took one giant step back so she she gave me the uh, the robe and the, and the little towels and left or, or, or stepped back away and then I was guided through doing the embarrassing <laughs> cleansing ceremony once I had the robe on and I kind of shrugged off that experience we headed towards the actual meeting uh, and I didn't even know that it was really going to be this big of a meeting but this unprecedented meeting between the seven different groups And above um, above the, the doorway in the main room, they had Vesica Pisces symbols above each doorway. And uh, the, the little hole in the middle, it looked like you could stick a dowel piece of wood in there. It looked like it held something. One of the symbols I saw a few times was there was a large gold star and next to it a smaller red star both of them with eight points and it ended up being on the main table when I walked in for this for this meeting and they had like this is very accurate by the way uh, the, the placement of it all and this is when they started really speaking this pre-Acadian language and, uh, they, and that's when they started also discussing what a threat our scalar weaponry had become to them and how we, we were basically seeing all these underground bases weren't doing the intelligence to find out whose they were and when we were attacking them we weren't distinguishing between them we were just, oh there's one, hit it, hit it and it was, uh, it was causing them a lot of problems When I was taken to see the city, that's when I was blown away. I walk out of this, I walk out of this area and it's like when you walk up to a building for the first time and you find yourself looking straight up, it's the perspective is so quickly changed on you. It, it was like being on a different planet. There were some of these natural pillars that were in between the ceiling and the floor. Remember. How big these pillars would have to be it was you could fit texas inside of this cavern and there were lights uh windows and lights and uh look like uh, balconies all up and down this giant pillar there were all of these craft that were flying around overhead as well and they were just disappearing into the, the side of a wall as if they were just dematerializing and passing straight through They had, uh, they had egg-shaped craft, cigar-shaped craft, and uh, irregular flying saucer type craft that were flying, and it looked like kind of like a highway. What was interesting were the giant buildings that just like domes of light. I hadn't, I didn't get close enough to see what they were, but they were very large, about the size of uh, like a football stadium. They were, they were very large. 
Later, I got to see this very similar type of uh, scene. I was flown in one of the egg-shaped craft over the city and through the wall on a recent expedition. Well, you know, what do the Anshar eat? They're definitely not carnivores. They very much into eating vegetables and fruits that are grown in a certain way, a very high vibratory way. It's interesting uh, how important that is to them, having high vibratory food. When Tirer told me that that was a very important part of this journey that most of us leave off. We'll work on the, you know, somewhat on the physical part, but we'll work on the spiritual part. We don't realize that we hit a glass ceiling until we can get our physical bodies in the right vibration for what we're putting in it. If these were, this was a huge area. I mean, there, these, these crops were enough. I mean, they could, they could feed millions of people. We were taken again to this, to this other area that was kind of a park, and it had all sorts of animals in there from a prehistoric era, an area that uh, I believe it was before the last cataclysm or the last ice age. There, you could hear the animals in the background. At one point, when we were close to being done, some sort of a loud cat or lion-type creature roared. I could feel it in my chest. It was. It startled uh, me, at least. And in the middle of that room was a giant obelisk that was very weathered. It looked very ancient. And above, directly above it, towards the top of the cavern, was this giant plasma bowl that was putting off the full spectrum of light that our sun does. And during this time when we were... I had just delivered this information, and David... Wilcock got that real shocked look on his face. I've seen a million times now. And uh, dug around and pulled out a file that, and, and then displayed it to all of us at Cosmic Disclosure. And it was uh, his current book cover. The uh, Saturn in the background, a giant glass obelisk with the sun above it, a light on a plasma ball above it. It was a really weird correlation. My trip there ended with me being brought to the libraries. When I arrived there, completely different look. Everything, all the stone was white and polished marble. And when I first arrived, there was a, a large, skinny gold arm sticking out of the ceiling holding a uh, crystal ball. And when I told David this, he uh, he remembered a story about a, I guess, a pyramid that was found in Bimini underwater, and there was a hand holding a crystal, and the guy pried it out. I guess uh, that reminded him of that story. Now, when we walked through the library, we would see these very old rolled up scrolls. We were seeing tablets and different weird looking books that were bound by like plant, plant material and leather all the way up to the end where I was seeing books that you could have ordered off of amazon.com a week before. They had the ISBN numbers on them. It was, it was amazing. So they keep abreast of all of our, of everything. They have full access to the internet. It was down there that, uh, Hari was telling me that there's a lot of information that has been out there and a lot of it about the Anunnaki and all of that that is fairly accurate but that the information very early on had been co-opted by this, uh, I guess, Illuminati type faction that wanted to make their religion our religion so they tried to skew some of the information. Apparently to these uh, raptor type beings, they had lost access to one of their crystal caverns that had a lot of information that was very important to them. And they wanted they wanted access to that information. And Kari had heard that as a adolescent, I had been brought down there to interface with the crystals. 
that was one of the big reasons they wanted us wanted wanted to inter interface with me is to try to see what kind of information they were able to glean. They they had one of these old crystals and they had it in this chamber that they they were trying to regrow it somehow. Kari wanted she had told me that she wanted to experience the uh, memory I had of connecting with the crystals. I was kind of leery about it. I I didn't know who she was. She was wanting to do something that is very personal. And she could tell I was I had intrepidation and she walked over to a wall, turned around and then she had this drink that she called the elixir of Isis that would calm me down and put me in a state to where I could uh, communicate with her better, and I turned it down. At that point, we we sat down and leaned across each other and had our elbows on our knees and held hands. And at that moment, I felt as though I was pulled outside of my body towards the middle of where we were, and there was some sort of, I don't know, it's like a whirlwind going on. And I started seeing all these flashes of her life. And as she was going through my life, trying to get to the point to where she could experience that experience, I was seeing those time periods in her life too. And, but a lot of what I was seeing, I wasn't able to interpret because I have such a different experience than she does. But there was an experience to where she was upset extremely that one of her childhood friends had been killed in an incursion with these raptor type beings. Um, there were a few things like that and that's when I was able to glean from her that she is a priestess set aside to be holy, that you know she does has never engaged in um, sex or any any of that. She was totally put aside just for what she was doing. And um, after I had that experience with her, I, I, my wife would walk in for months and I would just be sitting there staring at the wall, thinking about all of the conversations we've had. You know, and very little of the conversation that we had in the library and the information we exchanged and this mind meld have I really reported. I'm still processing a lot of it and I hope to get, get it out at some point. But it affected me profoundly. After that, I it was very soon after that, I found myself having to get on the high vibratory diet. I was eating corn dogs. I was 268 pounds. And I guess people that saw the show, you saw how quickly this transformation happened. It was, it was almost bizarre. People at Gaia, when I would show up each time, I was so much different. They, they had problems processing it. A lot of people out in the community are convinced that I've been replaced by a clone. <laughs> yeah, skinnier clone, yeah. Now the Anshar, they let me know that for millennia, they have been reaching out and interfacing with human beings and helping them channel information that is spiritually enlightening and also information that is scientific that will help us through certain periods. When I walked through this library area where all these people were kicked back in these egg-shaped chairs, it was, I don't know, it's surreal. You're walking and you see, all, you see all these people kicked back, kind of like in meditation mode. A lot of people would love to see that here. But that's when it was explained to me that they reach out, they'll pretend to, they'll reach out and a person usually will tell them who they're gonna be in the session. Like a person will be there, and they'll come to them and they'll be like, oh, are you blah, 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 from their belief system? And usually they'll be like, okay, it's a positive figure. Sure, we'll roll with it. <laughs> and then they start giving them, and then they start giving this positive spiritual information or technical information. And uh, not just this group are, are reaching out. Uh, we're in uh, telepathic com communication with uh, a lot of different beings, and a lot of them are these... Uh, uh, like Archangel and beings that are 
in, a, in another realm, not physically with us. The Inshire brought me on two different occasions down to Antarctica. The first time was just for what they called a reconnaissance flight. They wanted to get this information to the SSP Alliance and a few other people. And so they brought, they pretty much just brought me along for the ride. This is the vessel we were on. Gonzalez called it a bus for, because I guess when you, when you walk in, it's seated very similar to a bus. And it looks kind of like a bus. So he was calling it the Inchard bus. Now, one of, the, one of the interesting things I was shown is that directly below Antarctica, there is a huge kind of a cavern system that goes in under the water. And then it runs into the, the rift system that runs under the ice, Russia, ice, the Ross ice shelf, and runs up through, under the ocean in a rift system that goes on, runs all the way up to North America. We've, uh, the military industrial complex has have been exploiting those areas for many, many years. We've developed these giant black submarines that are electromagnetically propulsed, but they're the size of container ships. They're huge. They actually load with, I saw them unloading, but they will load with cranes, giant container ships, just like you will see in any harbor around here. And then they take them under the ground, in the water, down to various places in South America, and ultimately Antarctica. And a lot of the area they travel through are areas that were, uh, I guess, created between rift systems by the ancient builder race. They're very ancient underground, underwater tunnel systems. As we were flown in, once I really realized that there was an industrial area under the ice, I, I learned that from they told me not to get lost in the telemetry or the information because the craft we were on was very intuitive. If I would wonder about something, all of a sudden all this data would come up about it. And the experience was happening so quickly, if I would look at the data, I would miss a whole lot of other. So she was telling me the data is being captured, it will be sent to the proper people. Just focus on looking out the window, basically. It wasn't a window. But And one of the things we saw was a giant in the middle of this sprawling uh, industrial area, obviously built by humans. They had a huge power plant that was, uh, it, it created power from geothermal. It went into the ground and the, the geothermal heat allowed them to create steam, which works a lot like a, uh, uh, you know, like nuclear power here that we use. There were large buildings and structures. Like I said, mostly what was above ground there looked like a military type base and industrial, like they were building something and excavating something. I wasn't quite sure. A lot of the steam plumes were coming up from pools of, of water. The water was so hot that it was steaming that was coming out. And come to find out, that's what's creating a lot of these ice caverns is the geothermal heat coming up. And um, it's it's, incre it's increasing. The geothermal heat is getting more and more active down there. It's raising the entire temperature of, of the ice shelf by like one degree every couple of years, which is enough to cause a massive melt at some time in the future if it keeps occurring at that rate. The excavation that we're doing underneath the ice is further destabilizing the ice. And it's, it's a problem right now. It, it could cause some serious issues if a, if a giant uh, shell broke off and fell in the water. It could cause tsunamis. <coughs> and they're doing most of their excavating with steam, pressurized steam, to clear out areas where they are finding ancient palm trees, ancient structures. Mastodons, woolly mammoth type creatures, they're finding them everywhere. 
they were flash frozen. After that trip, I returned back to the inner earth hangar area through this blue swirling vortex that was just above the water. That's why I've gone in and out of it you know, several times now. One of the groups that I didn't know about until Ari told me about them was a group called the Banished. This is a group that is made up of people that have been kicked out of inner earth societies over millennia because they didn't want to live by the rules. A lot of them, it turns out, just fell in love with surface humanity. No matter, even though we're going through these wild, crazy times and we're mostly misbehaving, something about us enamored them. And they came out and wanted to live amongst us and help us grow. But at the same time, they have service to self type uh, agendas as well. So they're not. They're not uh, seen as positive, more neutral. I, my first encounter with the Banished, I was actually uh, down at Long Island on our trip, our, our trip last year, uh, family trip. I was laying in the bed, and my son was in the bed next to me, and then there was another queen-size bed in the hotel where my wife and daughter were laying, and. I woke up and I see a woman's head above me and she's looking this way and then she looks down and realizes I'm awake and looks surprised and then she reaches down and just touches me like that real quick and then it was over. <coughs> it was uh, disconcerting to me because my family was in the room and afterwards I was having a lot of really weird dreams, thoughts that I don't normally have. Very bizarre thoughts and, and feelings. And um, as I started to find out more about these people, I started to find out that uh, they tend to seek people in positions of power. They try to intermarry into rich families or powerful families. And that they were having children with the, these regular human beings. Now, it was probably about six weeks I was, I was having all of these bad dreams, weird thoughts, just, you know, I just wasn't myself. And I was, and I had met with Kari a few times during that time period. Finally, I was pulled down in the middle of the night, white flash teleportation, and um, she guided me to this room that had a, a table on it, where she told me that this, uh, uh, banished person named Mara had infected me somehow with entity attachments and that these entity attachments were being used to keep tabs on me and also to get information or intelligence about what was going on with the Anshar. She had me lay down and she pulls out this real long crystal and starts waving it over me. And it's, it's making noises kind of like how uh, crystal glasses with water in them, you rub your finger around them, they make kind of a singing noise. It was kind of, it was making these different noises, and then all of a sudden I started seeing these shadows darting away. So, you know, they were removed, I was glad they were removed, but I wasn't uh, very happy that they were there to, to begin with. I asked her why she hadn't removed them in our prior meetings, or at least told me about them. And she stated that they had to wait till uh, they had tried to attach to my energy vortexes, but just before they completely attached to remove them. The most recent trip, I was taken down where Gonzalez was already waiting for me. And uh, they uh, we were brought down to this different hangar. And this is the time when we got in a one of these egg-shaped craft, and they just start flying us through the walls and over the city. I got to see that scene that you saw flying over the city and before we flew through another wall. This, uh, we went up through a, a blue swirl, came out of the ocean basically in, in the blue swirl, and darted very quickly and, and got to where we were going in Antarctica. 
they didn't slow down. They headed straight for a wall, just like they would do in uh, the inner earth, just, uh, in the caverns. It went right through the ice. We ended up in a very similar area I'd been to before, the giant uh, cavern of ice, where about a football field or two away were a bunch of people steaming the ground, digging, and they didn't notice us. I, I don't know if we were cloaked or not. So Carvey was with us, and two of the real tall Asian-looking uh, inner earth beings with the crystals under their head, under their forehead and then Gonzalez and I, and they had us put on these uh, real fine mesh, almost like chain of mail suits. We would put them on, put the boots on, and they would just come together, just melt, mesh together like one piece. And then they had us put on this thing that you put your head in through the front. It was kind of like a fencing mask and it sealed up behind us, and then a screen lit up, and you could see everything going on around you. It was really amazing. We could see all these bodies that were lined up pretty close to the snowbank that were of all different types. There were some of these, what, were, what I've described as the pre-Adamite types with large skull, 12 to 14 foot tall, and it looked like the bodies had been through something incredible. There, some of their arms were stretched out and wrapped around their torsos. So they, they, were, they were pretty beat up. And there were different types of humans that were there too. Gonzalez had with him a, a special core sample kind of tool that we were using to push into these frozen dead bodies to get genetic samples. He was also taking some sort of images as he was taking the sample. One of the ones that I did a sample from was, there was a probably a little bit shorter than five foot tall being that was, that was rolled, curled up much like this. <clears throat> and they had a tail that was sticking out, kind of out and frozen. The, I could see the folds where the tail, where the tail connects to the back, there were these weird, like, kind of folds of skin. And uh, I had to stick the uh, probe in there and get a genetic sample out for them. But uh, was one of the interesting things is that uh, people in those programs, they were calling this a Pompeii on ice because of the way these bodies were discovered. They were discovered very in a very eerie, similar way to Pompeii. These were, the one on the, on the right is one of these original pre-Adamite type beings. And uh, they had the long, elongated skulls, kind of the fatty pockets on their chests, kind of a pot belly as well, and very wide hips, very interesting wide hips. And, of course, many of y'all have seen that with the, the ancient Egyptian depictions of some of the pharaohs. Akhenaten and some of them that were depicted with strange physiology. And some, some of these uh, elongated skull beings that ended up ruling Egypt and other places were, they were survivors or rem remnants after the last cataclysm that happened. These, I guess, lack of a better word, these Atlanteans were stranded in little enclaves all over the planet. They no longer had access to their technologies or most of their technologies or each other. They were separated and really didn't begin to talk with each other again. The group, there was two different groups. One group was uh, Europe, Africa, area and another group was here in the Americas. And until after the time of Columbus, they were not able to really uh, interact with each other. And there seems that there is a long standing competition or feud between the two groups, as it is. These images really 
show, I guess, the strange bodies that they have, the, the pockets of fat on the belly and the, the real wide hips and narrow waist. It's striking. Back to the, the original, the bodies we were looking at. Um, we uh, were then shown that there was a little bit of stonework sticking out of the snowbank we were next to. So, without missing a stride, uh, Kari and the two other inner earth people just walked through it as if it wasn't there. And Gonzalez looked at me, I looked at him, and we followed them. And uh, when we got inside, the room was lit, and it was a library. There were all different types of scrolls around, very large, looked like uh, someone with large hands, a large bean, was using it. And on the wall, there was uh, a bowl, and there was a little bit different than this image that was depicted. There was three rings with a arrow stuck in the middle of it, almost like a target. The uh, two Asian looking inner earth people walked directly up to one of these trays and started loading metal scrolls into this collapsible crate that they had with them. And it was crinkling, it sounded a little bit like tin, but I was able to see one of them that had flopped open a little bit and it looked like laser etched symbols, all, all in it, laser etched symbols. And to this, to this day, I still don't know what type of intel or information it was, but obviously they wanted to remove it before that area was excavated. So, you know, how is all this information really important to us? You know, we, our consciousness is expanding at a huge rate right now. Finding out more information about these inner earth groups that are so that have been so tied to us in our journey here on planet over millennia will help us understand our history but also a lot of the information that we're looking at where so much of it has been turned into different belief systems or religions that you know people will sit there and uh, regurgitate information um, in a way that they give other belief systems you know crap for, you know, we'll, we'll give people crap for being uh, so much of a fundamentalist when we're the same way with our belief systems. What will help is that, is if we start to open our minds a little bit to other information and realize that, it, I mean, if we can look at this information from with different eyes, we may get even more useful information out of it, different perspective of looking at it and looking at ourselves. Of course, I have to talk about the graphic novel. Um, interestingly enough, when I was uh, conversing with Tier Air, he stated that all this is really great work for planting information to the seeds of consciousness, but they wanted not only me, but all other light workers out there to find a way to not just be preaching to the choir. The people I'm talking to here, you already have a propensity to believe some of this stuff or believe uh, a version of it. We need to get this information out through our different talents, different ways of art, music, uh, different types of media. And, and I don't want people to say it, feel like they have to just spread the blue avian message or this information, but they, I think everyone right now is being pushed to spread this positive information, loving information in a way that will kick in the hundredth monkey effect on a larger scale. More and more people, will, they won't know why, they'll want to be more positive. Basically, I was told to do this and uh, get this information to the, the gaming people, the sci-fi people, that their consciousness is already primed for a lot of this information, but they see it as entertainment purposes only. But if you can get a message in to them, you know, why not? So... I think that's what we're going to start seeing a lot of people that do what we do with the, uh, people with the arts, music. You're going to find people being compelled to spread this blue avian type message of being more loving, forgiving yourself, 
being service to others and trying to change the world one person at a time. What is their message? Their message for humanity is that we need to become more loving. We need to become forgiving of ourselves and forgiving of others. We need to focus on becoming more service to others on a daily basis. And we need to focus on raising our vibration and our consciousness.